welcome. Welcome to our talk with Scott Olson. Um, <laughs> um, just to let everybody know uh, who's watching that we do have a very small uh, fan club audience of Scott here right now who are, who are going to ask really hard questions at the end. So if you want to ask a question, feel free to jump in onto chat and we will do that. Um, we're really thrilled to have Scott here to bring us in through another angle into this exhibition. Um, just a little bit about Scott. He is a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology at the University of Iowa, hoping to graduate soon. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> right now, grad school life is the way to go. Um, he actually met Abby and our artist in resident, Doug Dale, an undergrad at Grinnell. And we're thrilled to have him here. He has focused um, his field work in the US and in Germany. And he focuses on minority communities, AIDS, history of sexuality, LBGT activism. Um, and his current research focuses on the collective and historical memory of queer activists in Berlin and the role in contemporary debates over politics and public space. So Doug, uh, Doug. <laughs> So, so Scott is going to bring um, an interesting dialogue through that lens and through um, his studies into this show. So the show, in case you haven't had a chance to see it, is um, Abby Lowell and Malika Tolford um, talking uh, treasures and tarnish and treasures, the life of Heinrich Schliemann. And um, Abby and Malika are both artists in residence with us in 2008. And they have come back to reunite their creative spirits and present this amazing installation of their interpretation of Heinrich Schliemann's work. Please come and see it. Um, there's a wonderful field guide that will bring you through their amazing imagination, but pretty much Schliemann coined himself um, as the father of anthropology. He, in the 1863, decided as someone who was going to retire on his business wealth and gold rush money to go dig up Troy, and he was going to follow the rules of Homer and dig up um, what he thought was Troy, and um, through wild abandonment, and I would say um, an abundance of privilege, he was able to dig up um, and sort of get the wheels going on archaeology. And it was just recently in the 70s that um, it came to light that perhaps he wasn't the most kosher in his attempt. Um, and Abby and Malika have presented um, Schliemann's discoveries, but then their own interpretation of what he must have felt and what they what they interpret as two women looking at this man's work. So that's my cliff notes on the exhibition. <laughs> um, so I'm going to introduce Scott, and I'm, we're really excited to be able to talk about this through a new lens. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, Stephanie mentioned and uh, so generously um, introduced me. I'm here to kind of think about um, some of the things that um, I was think, or to talk about some of the things that I was um, thinking about as I uh, walked through Abby and Malika's show, um, and especially kind of thinking about it sort of through the lens of um, collective memory and also thinking about sort of like who was this guy Schliemann and what was he doing, um, sort of where in the world was he, what was the context that he was doing this stuff in, and then also kind of what are the implications for a lot of that stuff um, for the way that we think about the past and, um, and history and archaeology today. Um, uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I did uh, a year of field work and also kind of I was, was back and forth in Berlin working with um, LGBTQ activist, activists. Um, so even though uh, my stuff doesn't usually have me talking about antiquity or Homer stories or someone like Schliemann, um, I do spend a lot of time thinking about how people construct and reconstruct the past according to their own um, politics and desires, um, what uh, we call the study of collective memory. Um, so these are some photos from my field work. Um, I'm happy to talk about that later on, um, but as you can see, not a lot about uh, Homer or Troy or Schliemann or anything like that. Um, okay, so um, kind of the way that I'm gonna 
the way that I've sort of structured this discussion is I'm gonna um, uh, I'm gonna sort of start at the very end of um, Lowe and Tolford's exhibition, um, and I'm gonna kind of work my way back out. Um, so I'm, I'm starting. I'm, I hope all of you have had the opportunity to see um, this really uh, incredible work. Um, and if you haven't, I, there are spoilers ahead. So um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but uh, so yeah, so I'm starting in that kind of temple that um, Lowe and Tolford constructed um, at the end of the exhibition uh, to kind of kick us off. So I wanna take a look at this work, just kind of look at it uh, for a moment. This was um, obviously, um, Lowe and Tolford's construction. This was Abby um, sort of meticulously drawing these figures and uh, cutting them out of uh, paper and projecting light through them. And I think it sort of gives the image a sense of, um, it's sort of like romanticism and also like reverence and um, and it glorifies them, right? I mean, like there's the little votives underneath. And I mean, this is, and uh, referring to the space as a temple, as a place of like glorification and um, uh, uh, sort of romanticization of these figures and these characters and these stories. Um, and so when we then sort of look at the um, source material for a lot of these images, uh, we sort of see how, how Abby, constructed them from these um, uh, Greco-Roman statues, um, these sculptures that sort of appear in this like, kind of this like pure white marble um, that looks, and it's, and that, that sort of like pure white marble sort of carries with it a lot of that, um, that feeling of like reverence and glorification and purity, right? Is this, um, uh, this sort of like un, unimpeachable past. Um, or this sort of like almost timeless past. Um, and I wanna like kind of think about that as a starting point for uh, this talk a little bit more critically um, because uh, a lot of scholarship now, um, and as, as I'll kind of get into later, um, is uh, has suggested that a lot of these statues actually were painted um, quite colorfully. And so this, idea of the kind of like timeless white pure marble as like this epitome of platonic beauty is actually um, an idea that came from um, a specific set of people in a specific time. Um, so uh, through sort of as a way of kicking that off, I'm, I'm interested in thinking about um, that time, like the like what was it that sort of produced that way of thinking? Um, and why is it that we started to see these statues this way? And then how did that sort of become this romanticized, glorified um, picture uh, that we sort of know today? Um, okay. So a lot of that has been credited to um, this man, uh, Johann Joachim Winkelmann. Um, he is uh, an archaeologist um, who's also sort of a founding figure in a, lot, a number of fields. So classical ar archaeology being one of them, um, as well as art history and a number of other things. He, um, so he was, uh, he predates Schliemann. He um, was born in the 18th century um, and uh, died before Schliemann was born. Um, but he was around in Germany during sort of like the enlightenment period when um, a sort of ideas about rationality and how we come to have knowledge were really starting to change. Um, and uh, so a lot of kind of foundational texts like um, from Immanuel Kant and a lot of the um, documents that we sort of cite as the founding ideals of the United States um, uh, system of government, et cetera, sort of come from this time when um, uh, folks, especially in the West are rethinking um, how we come to organize uh, knowledge, uh, et cetera. Okay, so out of that comes this guy who's trying to think about like what defines beauty? Like what's sort of like this platonic idea of beauty? What is it and where does it come from? And he decided that he was really into 
these like white Greco-Roman statues. Um, so he says, uh, um, uh, color adds to beauty, but it is not beauty itself. And he's like a bit of a, a drama queen, so um, that's <laughs> why I really like this passage. Um, uh, rather, it raises the overall beauty of the form, just as the flavor of wine becomes sweeter through its color in a transparent glass than in the most exquisite gold chalice. Um, but color should have little stake in the consideration of beauty because it is not color, but the creation itself which accounts for its essence. Um, and this is where uh, this has not aged well. Um, just as white is the color which reflects the broadest spectrum of light and, there is, and is thereby more delicate, I don't know what that means, but uh, um, the beautiful body becomes more beautiful the whiter it is. Um, yeah, so uh, I think um, from uh, certainly from our contemporary vantage point, there are some kind of racialized undertones to that. And, um, and I want to kind of keep thinking about that as we move forward. Um, whether or not uh, Winkelmann was thinking along those lines, um, I can't say. But um, I think that has that sort of sense of whiteness as this sort of inherent beauty has come um, to shape a lot of the way that we look at classicism and also um, the West uh, from this period. Okay, and just to show you what a lot of these statues actually look like, um, I think uh, they were quite vibrant, um, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, so um, we have a lot of um, forensic scientists have um, done a lot of really compelling research on this and um, have sort of found traces of these colors. And even in um, sort of archival, there's a lot of archival evidence um, of sort of of folks talking about like the colorful statues. Um, and so even uh, it, it, stands to, um, it stands to reason that someone like Winkelmann also probably um, would have at, at the very least had evidence accessible to him that these statues were not white uh, originally. Um, so, but they, um, nevertheless, they, uh, the, uh, 18th century archeologists like Winkelmann um, thought that these statues looked better as this sort of like pure white marble form. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, um, I'm sort of, as I'm walking through um, Abby and Malaika's show, I'm sort of thinking about this like classical nostalgia, right? There's this sort of inherent in that vision of this like pure, like even more beautiful form because it is white, um, is this sort of nostalgic idea of uh, these figures coming from a time when like, um, we were at like the epitome of like, like literal, like platonic beauty. Um, and so I'm sort of thinking about Schliemann as being um, sort of sitting in a lot of these ideas, sort of think, um, un perhaps unconsciously um, considering uh, this, having this sort of nostalgic vision of Troy, um, this glorified, romanticized vision of um, the classics, the classical period, um, uh, and and such a glorification um, of it to the extent that he sought to find it in the ground and um, uh, sort of even um, live out a sort of <laughs> Hellenistic fantasy with his wife, um, which I will uh, come to in a moment. Um, uh, but this thinking, um, among other things, um, becomes the basis for this kind of classical nostalgia as a justification for seeing, like, quote unquote, Western civilization as inherently superior to the rest of the world, um, right? If these, if these white, beautiful forms from, like, quote unquote, the birthplace of the West are the most beautiful, then surely um, the West is the best. Um, okay, so this is that uh, Hellenic. Um, fantasy moment. <laughs> um, so uh, this is an image that, I, that um, Lowe and Tolford draw from um, throughout the show. Um, and they're sort of thinking about this glorification as both like a projection of these ideas of like a glorified past, um, a nostalgic past, um, a, a projection. And also I would like to think about them as a kind of palimpsest. So a palimpsest is a document um, 
which has, which like on a piece of paper, which has been like scraped and scrubbed clean so that the paper can be reused. Um, but inevitably, the, there are traces of what was there before left on the paper. And so it creates this um, document where you can kind of see um, a past to what is already there. Um, and so I want to think about uh, kind of moving out of the temple what um, Lowe and Tolford have done um, uh, with this sort of palimpsest of um, history and past, right? Uh, Schliemann projecting these ideas, this glorified nostalgic um, uh, vision of the past, even like onto his own wife. Um, so, uh, um, Abby and, Tol and, and Malaika show um, the image of Sophia sort of scraped clean and rewritten with um, Schliemann's words and, um, and uh, Malaika's patterns. Um, and then as you can see on these banners, on these prints, uh, the images in negative, I, I sort of think of as sort of invoking this concept of memory sort of through their haziness, right? It's sort of like um, the negative sort of denaturalizes the image and sort of makes us and sort of subverts the idea of like a naturalistic representation and rather um, allows us to kind of see that projection more clearly. Um, okay, so this is the part where I'm gonna go on like a bit of a journey through uh, German history, but I wanna, um, uh, so just uh, bear with me, um, but uh, I wanna kind of keep exploring these ideas of like both the palimpsest and also um, this sort of glorification of classicism as sort of the grounds of Western superiority. Um, and since we're in Germany anyway, um, we sort of have to talk about um, the Nazis in the 1930s. Um, so in the way that I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna talk a lot about architecture because I think, I mean, there are a lot of different examples of this and a lot of different ways to talk about this, but I think architecture is a really, um, especially visible one. Um, so as an anthropologist working in Germany, um, I have a hard time thinking about um, that kind of, that glorification of the classics um, without thinking about how those ideas became an ideological foundation um, for fascism and genocide under the Nazis. Um, so uh, um, as you might be familiar, a lot of um, the kind of ideas of like racial superiority that informed um, the genocidal regime um, in the 1930s in Europe uh, were, sort of used like the, these stories, the very stories that Schliemann was um, interested in as kind of evidence of um, quote unquote Western civilization being uh, superior to the others. Certainly that wasn't the only thing that they were um, sort of projecting onto, but it was certainly um, something that they were excited about. And you can really see it in a lot of um, like the buildings that they construct. So this is um, uh, the Neue uh, Reichskanzlei, which is um, like the new uh, um, chancellery essentially. Um, so uh, in Berlin, um, uh, sort of constructed by Hitler's regime. Um, as you can see, this, it's sort of this like obvious example of um, this particular kind of neoclassical architecture. So you've got the columns and you have, you know, like the naked dudes holding torches and um, uh, it sort of is like this very overt reference to um, uh, the classical period and sort of uses that as a way of like projecting Western superiority and domin dominance. Um, so it's this romanticized and nostalgic view that sort of same nostalgia um, that Winkelmann um, was interested in uh, and I think uh, Schliemann was as well. Um, so after the war, uh, what did Germany do with all these buildings, right? Most of these buildings are still standing um, and uh, uh, we obviously um, uh, post-war they had to do something um, to sort of scrape them clean, right? The palimpsest. Um, so here's one example. Um, this is the uh, Finanzamt Charlottenburg, um, which is like the finance office. Um, and you can see where they sort of like, obviously uh, this eagle was not holding a house number before. Um, uh, so they just kind of like tacked that on top of it, um, uh, on top of what was underneath um, as a way of uh, entnazifizierung or um, like denazification. Um, another, I think really, um, 
important or, or sort of visible example is the uh, Flughafen Tempelhof, which is the um, the airport in Berlin that um, that the Nazis built. Um, it's huge. It was the biggest airport in the world at the time, and you can see um, in 1945, um, right, sort of after liber after uh, the Allies um, uh, defeated the Nazi regime, um, there sort of on top of the ter main terminal building is that same eagle holding the um, swastika. And then uh, the same terminal building today um, with the pediment or the, the, the pedestal that the eagle was sitting on still intact, but of course the eagle has been removed. So um, you can sort of see where the, we've sort of scraped clean and rewritten. Um, we're sort of writing over and you can see the past that was there before, um, even if it's not still there. Um, and this brings up, I think, some really, um, sort of, the, there's a lot of political ambivalence with this, right? Because if you uh, take it down, then are you erasing it? Um, but if you leave it up, then that's commuting, communicating something else entirely. And to illustrate that, I wanna talk about um, the Frauenkirche in, in uh, Dresden. So this is the, um, the Frauenkirche, which was completely reconstructed. Um, so as you can see what it looked like in 1898, then it was bombed in the war, um, leaving ruins for most of the 20th century. And then um, sort of starting in the 90s and um, in, into the 2010s, it was completely reconstructed as if it had never been destroyed. Um, and I think, you know, obviously it's a beautiful Baroque building, um, but I think, but and a num myself and a number of scholars have thought about, you know, what does it mean to reconstruct this and completely do away with the ruins? Um, what are the risks of imagining a past where the atrocities of the 20th century never occurred? Um, so uh, one of those risks, I think, is um, uh, painting uh, Gentile Germans as victims, right? Saying that um, uh, that the destruction of the war um, victimized Germans, right? And uh, never mind why there was a war in the first place. Um, it also, I think, risks characterizing the Holocaust as aberrational. So um, if we've completely reconstructed this church, then the, there's sort of an implicit argument that um, the sort of thrust of the city of Dresden, the most important part of the city of, uh, of the city of Dresden's history, was its sort of its role in the Northern Baroque, and um, all of that stuff that happened in the 30s was like an oopsie, and uh, we don't have to think about that anymore because we've completely rebuilt it. Um, there's a much more complicated discussion here that I'm happy to get into, but I, I just want to kind of move on um, from that. But just to kind of think about, like, what does it mean to have these kind of historical palimpsests? What does it mean to try to um, uh, reshape the way that we're thinking about the past? Um, okay. So, um, and I think... Uh, Abby and um, Malaika have done, have, are, are implicitly asking those questions. Um, so uh, by writing themselves and their own histories and artifacts over those of Schliemann, um, Lowe and Tolford implicate their work and themselves in these troubling questions about how we ought to remember um, pasts like this. So this is an image from um, their uh, gallery talk. I've sort of um, Hilford, uh, a number of those images um, in the constructing my own presentation. But so this is um, a floor plan of the school where uh, Malaika um, did uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an archeological dig um, and she sort of transformed that floor plan into a pattern um, that then uh, Abby um, sort of projected onto a number of and, and printed onto a number of images throughout the show. Um, so here, I think um, Abby and Malaika are sort of blurring that distinction between their own histories and that of Schliemann and that of the stories that Schliemann was concerned with, right? It's a projection onto Schliemann's wife, but then sort of by proxy of Schliemann's wife, it's a projection onto Helen. Um, and so what do we, uh, how do we sort of think about the ways that we might implicate ourselves in those pasts. Um, so a few more examples that I found especially compelling were um, these images. So uh, more of that um, floor plan sort of printed onto the um, ceramics that um, Malaika produced, um, a map of the of, uh, present day, is that Istanbul? Um, 
uh, where Athens, um, present day Athens, um, sort of also transformed into this abstract pattern that was then printed onto other ceramics in the show. And my personal favorite, um, a, a print of like a G chat thread, um, I believe about Malika losing her debit card. In <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, sort of printed onto this piece of ceramic that sort of looks like it was unearthed from the ground. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so sort of um, think about how uh, Malika and Abby have implicated themselves in this history um, has me thinking a lot about um, these ideas about memory and the ambivalences of um, writing and rewriting. Um, Okay, so this sort of brings me finally to the, the, the opening part of the exhibition, um, which is the museum. Um, so as Tolford and Lowe discussed in their artist talk, um, museums are not a political objective institutions for the representation of historical objects, but they imbue the pasts they represent with the politics of the moment of their construction. So um, Tolford and Lowe's implication of themselves in Schliemann's past is to ask, what are the consequences of the institutions we have constructed for past making? What does it mean that these artifacts are housed in a museum? And, and what is it, how does it change the way that we think about the context in which they were created now that those objects have been completely decontextualized and moved to an entirely different part of the world and set in a glass case like this one? Um, and so again, I wanna ask, what was the historical context for these institutions in which, and, and, and what was the historical, excuse me, historical context for their creation? What were the political considerations that went into making, building a museum and putting a bunch of stuff in it seem like a good idea? Um, so that brings me back to another sort of journey through German history. Um, so Schliemann uh, lived during the period um, leading up to and beyond German unification. Um, I believe he was born in like, in the 18 teens or 1820s, and he died in 1890, um, which was sort of right in that moment when Germany was um, becoming uh, the, an iteration of the nation that we know today. Um, uh, so he lived during this period leading up to and beyond German unification, which was a period of intense industrialization and nation and empire building led primarily by the economically powerful Prussia. So you can see um, Germany at the time, um, so for most of the 19th century was kind of this collection of small states and duchies and free cities and um, kingdoms. Um, and uh, sort of throughout the 18th and into the 19th century, you can see Prussia um, just sort of really like dominate, dom like annexed a lot of it. Um, and so uh, there's a whole history here that um, sort of between Austria and Germany and um, a lot of those kind of smaller uh, kingdoms and uh, countries and, and duchies, et cetera, and free cities actually had political sympathies with Austria, but um, they, just because of the sort of economic power of Prussia, um, they ended up sort of becoming a part of like the Prussian vision of a unified Germany. Um, and so this is to also say that Germany was sort of late to the party uh, compared to its neighbors in terms of like nation and empire building. Um, so France and uh, the United Kingdom and Portugal and Spain were already sort of well-established colonial powers at this point. Um, and uh, Prussia, I think especially, and the leaders of Prussia sort of um, saw this as like they had some catching up to do, um, uh, which they did. Uh, so um, uh, during this period of unification throughout the 19th century, Prussian expansionism and colonization of the smaller German states, um, specifically through the economic and industrial domination of the more agrarian Austria, became the means through which especially uh, bourgeois and elite Germans began to grapple with the uncertainty and anxieties around the meaning of a German nation and culture. Um, catalyzed by an increasingly powerful economy, this brought about the establishment of important cultural institutions like universities and museums, which would contribute to this anxious deliberation over what it means to be German. So um, by establishing kind of these cultural centers of like, knowledge production, which is what a part of what a museum does, um, they're sort of saying that like they have, they're establishing a foundation for the existence of a German nation and culture sort of through the establishment of these institutions. Um, 
And I think one example of that that I think is particularly relevant to um, Lowe and Tolford's work is the Altus Museum in uh, Berlin, which was built in the 1830s um, and is a foundational institution of what was then the sort of nascent museum island. So now it's this like sort of sprawling museum com um, complex of uh, multiple different museums and um, that house a lot of different things. Um, uh, but it be specifically, it became the home of um, the Antikensammlung, which is like kind of one of the largest collections of um, antiquities uh, in Europe. And um, uh, specifically in 1830 is when a lot of these um, artifacts moved to the Altus uh, Museum in Berlin. Um, and it's a collection of ancient Greek, Roman, and Etruscan artifacts, um, which were donated um, and taken probably not so willingly um, from the private collections of nobles and royals and robber barons like Schliemann um, sort of throughout the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, uh, so the establishment um, reconfiguration and representation of these collections in these new museums became an important part of grappling with the contemporary politics of establishing a new German empire under Prussian control. Imagining a particular story of ancient Greece and Rome became an important part of how 19th century Prussians wrote the story of a new Germany. Um, so by sort of decontextualizing these objects, putting them and moving them from the Mediterranean to um, uh, a museum uh, like this one and putting them in glass cases, they're sort of implicitly drawing this connection between this romanticized and glorified vision of like Western civilization and the nascent German empire. Of course, um, these artifacts are still in Germany. Um, so the two uh, images on the right are um, uh, contemporary uh, pictures of uh, this collection, which is still at um, the Altus Museum. Um, and despite efforts from people today to repatriate them. Um, and so this, I think, leads or points towards that um, politics of repatriation um, that uh, um, uh, Tolford and Lowe are, um, I think, sort of implicitly thinking about through this exhibition. Um, what does it mean that these objects have been decontextualized and taken away? Um, what kinds of claims do the contemporary governments and the, and the contemporary people of the places where these objects originated have to those objects and the descendants of those people have to those objects? Um, all uh, uh, conversations which are sort of hotly debated at the moment um, and have um, deep implications for justice and for um, sort of righting a lot of the wrongs of uh, uh, the colonial pasts of uh, places like um, Germany and France and the United, uh, United Kingdom and the United States and um, all of these other places. Um, and so that brings me uh, um, sort of towards the end of my discussion. Um, and I wanna, um, think about this sort of last, this moment in um, the exhibition where um, Tolford and Lowe sort of point the finger at us, the viewers, um, the visitors to the exhibition um, uh, directly. Um, so this is uh, an image from, I think, um, a newspaper coverage, um, which is an artist's rendering of people looking in cases at the artifacts that Schliemann found. Um, and of course, um, Abby and Malaika have rendered that image onto their recreations of Schliemann's artifacts to then put in cases for us, the, today's viewers, to look at. Um, so this is us looking at a recreation of Schliemann's artifacts in a case printed with another artist's rendering of people looking at Schliemann's artifacts in a case, um, which poses, I think, the final question of this, um, of my discussion, which is um, what does all of this history of Nazis and empire building and museums mean for us as Americans in St. Louis in the 20th century, 21st century? Which is to say, I don't like have a really great answer, but, um, uh, but as a way of considering that, um, I will end by saying that we're sitting on the original homeland of the Osage, Kickapoo, Quapaw, Miami, Peoria, and Sioux people. Um, and although the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or um, NAGPRA, as a lot of folks know it, um, was effective in 1990, um, so that act requires institutions 
sponsored by the federal government to return cultural items and human remains to the lineal descendants of the people to whom they belonged. Um, the legal process for filing these claims is long and cumbersome and expensive. And as a result, uh, considerable amounts of native artifacts are still housed in white museums and collections, many of which are giant neoclassical structures that uh, Schliemann himself might have admired. Thank you very much. And then do you guys have any questions? All right. Ask it and then I'm asking you to repeat the question in your answer like you're in a different Okay, okay. So everybody can hear. Uh, yeah. Um, just a, a small question about was he actually fraudulent when he took these records or were these artifacts real? Uh, so um, the question was, was Ashleyman like fraudulent in the artifacts that he collected or were they like what they said he was? Um, and I think that uh, <laughs> Abby might be able to answer that question better than I can. Oh, um, yeah, it was it was a mix. So uh, he. Sorry, I want people to oh, hear. Of course, you. yeah. Hey, it's it's Abby. Hi. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> <laughs> um, the person who first got me doing this. Um, the so uh, the, Schliemann was digging at sites that were sort of generally acknowledged to be probably the most likely place if, if Troy, as Homer imagined it, existed. Okay. Um, this would probably be where it was. His like was the mound that he was digging in Turkey. Um, the question, uh, so the, the, that mound was actually the site of nine consecutive uh, civilizations on the same site. Uh, a contemporary anthropologist would probably tell you, or historian would probably tell you that Homer's Troy was most likely Troy 6 or 7A. Really, I'm just trying to remember what Malika told me because she's the nerd on this stuff. Uh, but Schliemann just sort of plowed through the, the mound with reckless abandon and probably a lot of a lot of joy, for being honest. <laughs> um, and so if it was shiny and looked valuable, he grabbed it, he 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 um, stole artifacts from other from other sites and then planted them in this in this mound to make it seem like it was irrelevant. Um, discovery, and he also, I believe there is also insinuation that he had artifacts um, fabricated on site. So he had he had artisans like making things to add to this treasure uh, to make it so, which this sort of final um, grouping of artifacts that he wound up with, he called Priam's treasure, the King of Troy and the Iliad, uh, which was just a complete like random assortment of shiny stuff. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Malaika through the chat says, um, uh, the end, quote, the antiquities unearthed by Dr. Schliemann at Troy acquire for us a double interest, um, wrote British linguist Archibald Seiss in 1896. Quote, they carry us back to the later stone ages of the Aryan race. Yeah, so I think, so Malaika, um, and she also is d discussed, um, she's, she said, we should talk about how Schliemann brought the swastika to Germany. He found a million objects at Troy with them inscribed as decorative patterns, right? So these ideas about sort of race and, and racial superiority um, being grounded in like these, this uh, n classical nostalgia um, uh, for the like Western civilization, I think is really, a really important thing that I, I sort of struggle to not think about um, through their exhibit. Um, okay, any other questions? Yes. Hi, it's me, Stephanie, <laughs> Kirkland, the Deputy Director of Craft Alliance. Um, Scott, I was wondering along your studies, and maybe not so much through antiquities, but even in your cultural pursuits, how do artists play a role in defining or expressing cultural identity? Oh gosh, um, that's a really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's a whole book right there. Um, okay, next time. Yeah. Just give us a dabble, and we'll talk uh, about the series. So I think, um, I, just to kind of stay in the world of um, Germany, I think. Um, gosh, I wish I could like bring up images right now, but um, the so there's um, I think. The first thing that kind of comes to my mind, and also because I'm working on this chapter of my dissertation, um, is uh, memorials are, are like an example of a way of thinking about that. So um, the this moment of 
of how do we think about the past? How do we think about, how do we contend with um, these atrocities that maybe we have committed or at the very least our ancestors have committed um, is a really, that reckoning has sort of come to shape a great deal of um, German national um, identity and um, a lot of, and I think one of the most common access points for that reckoning, especially for visitors, um, but then also for locals um, is through these memorials. Um, so there's uh, one of the best is um, uh, Eisenmann's uh, memorial in Berlin, um, which is an entire city block. And it's these um, concrete uh, Stelle um, is what sort of he calls them, but they're these like giant monoliths um, that sort of start very low, kind of ankle height. And then as you kind of walk between them, suddenly they're over your head. And um, it's very, the experience of it is very disorienting. So like kind of it, provokes, it's a very kind of emotionally fraught um, ex way of experiencing this memorial. Um, it's not uh, naturalistic or representational at all, right? It's, it's very abstract, um, but it produces um, an emotional experience, which is I think something that uh, art does very aptly. Um, and I think that experience is something that came out of this, um, Reckoning, this um, the fancy German word is Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Uh, um, I know it's a very long and very fun <laughs> stuff. Um, uh, oh, sorry, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, um, which literally means like going to terms with the past. Um, and like that, I think, um, is something that really only, you really, you can only get to sort of through the specific political, historical, and social context of contemporary Germany. Um, and the, that artists have been able to render those, that feeling into literal concrete um, is I think one of, uh, a great example of how um, artists can be a part of um, thinking about the past and national identity, et cetera. Um, okay, I'm gonna call my mom and then <laughs> Well, I'm just curious, would the Vietnam Memorial be along that line? Absolutely. Yeah. It creates this feeling, but really very simple, but it's pretty dynamic. Yeah, I think Maya Lin's memorial in Washington, D.C. is like a really famous example of that. Um, and it was one that was controversial when it was yeah, built. I was going to say, um, she went through the ringer to get that built. Right. And, and now, I mean, yeah, it's incredible. Um, and now, I mean, it's, I think, truly a treasure. Um, uh, I think at the time, the fact that it wasn't naturalistic, the fact that it wasn't representative, um, put a lot of people off of it. Um, uh, but now I think the sort of that emotional experience that it produces, you know, sort of seeing your reflection in the polished marble, um, sort of behind the names of the um, folks who died um, is something unique and something that emerges from, from the context in which she produced it. And it wasn't white. Sorry. And now oh, really? <laughs> uh, welcome to American politics, I guess. Uh, Abby. Okay, so uh, my, I talked talk about how one of my interests is to like, being engaged with the Schumann, and make this body of work, was about that impulse to sort of put himself in the history of the um, his own, like, I got the desire into and, and kind of reformulating the right? So, and that was something that Malaya and I did in our work, right? As we were telling this history, we were very explicitly like putting ourselves in that work. And I know that you, in your work, think about specifically like queer folks in Berlin, like how they kind of collectively and oftentimes in great conflict try to kind of replicate the past and come to what becomes a formally narrative shock. What happened and who was there? Who happened, yeah. Right. And I think this is. I swear, I'm. I, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm so sorry. There's a question. No. <laughs> well, and to repeat this question for your answer. I think. I think Schliemann, like, it's very easy to after to come away with like that kind of narcissistic impulse being really damaging and resulting in like thievery and all these things, right? But like, I wonder if 
But I think the fact is that it involves that sort of projection of self and like the desire to own history or some part of it, identify with it. And like I was wondering in your research, do you see that that kind of human desire also has like positive or like what's good about that? Is anything good about that? Um so okay, so Abby's question was that she's thinking about this um this impulse that Schliemann has to sort of project himself um, uh, onto this history that he's sort of obsessing over and, um, and to own that history, um, to lay claim to it. Um, and, and, and Abby is sort of concerned about the narcissism that's sort of a part, like, emer that emerges from that impulse. Um, uh, however, she also sort of identifies with that impulse that idea of like wanting to see oneself in in the narratives that they uh, find exciting and are passionate about and um, obsess over. Um, and so she wonders if there's um, sort of thinking about that within the context of collective memory, right? And within the context of um, the study of past making, um, what is there to be redeemed from that sort of impulse that may, might seem um, otherwise narcissistic. I think, uh, I mean, it's, so first of all, as like a cultural anthropologist, we're, we don't really think that much about um, like, is it good or is it bad? Which I know can make it a really uh, frustrating field of study, um, uh, uh, especially when we do like contract work and people want recommendations. But um, uh, I think, um, so I think there is a lot of there is a lot of redemption to be had from that. So one um, particular example uh, in my work, um, there is this fight over um, a, a trans activist um, who was present at the um, Stonewall uprising in New York and played an important role in it. Um, and uh, her name is Marsha P. Johnson, and she um, did not call herself transgender at the time, um, that language didn't exist in the 60s and 70s. Um, she called herself a number of things. She called herself uh, transsexual. She called herself, um, or she actually, I'm not sure if she used that word. She definitely called herself a transvestite, which today is a word that we would not use. Um, uh, and one of the folks that I worked with in Berlin, um, his identity is also sort of akin to that. Um, he calls himself um, a tunta, which is actually kind of a German pejorative word. It kind of um, means something sort of similar to faggot. Um, and uh, he, and so there's a lot of kind of discussion of um, Marsha P. Johnson um, and sort of trying to reclaim her as like a trans hero, as like a transgender hero, someone um, for transgender people today to look back to and say, hey, look, um, uh, trans people were there at one of the most pivotal moments of LGBT activist history, and therefore um, they have a place in today's movement. And so I think um, I'm not here to decide whether or not Marsha P. Johnson was trans. Like she's uh, she's no longer with us, and she can't tell us. Um, so, uh, but I think that impulse or that impulse to sort of see oneself, perhaps problematically. Um, using contemporary categories uh, in the past, um, things that sort of would not have made sense back then, um, can be incredibly redemptive. I mean, I think it, it, it energizes a movement, right? In this case, it, it gives people um, something to motivate themselves or to see themselves as having a past, um, which I think is one of the most important parts of collective memory. Um, so, right, if we, and, and this is where I think, um, I don't wanna editorialize too much, but this is where I think if we sort of divorce ourselves from this, I, from this obsession with like what really happened, right? Like as if we could reconstruct a perfect narrative that, that is an objective recounting of the past. Um, sort of my personal opinion on that is that it doesn't exist, right? Like we're always in the process of making the past. Um, and so that process of past making, I think can be exciting, right? When we, um, when we stop sort of um, fetishizing or obsessing over objectivity, um, which I know uh, there's a whole discussion there to be had 
that's much longer. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how I would answer that question. Sorry, that was really long. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So is preservation in and of itself perhaps a redemptive uh, situation from saving it? So we have these artifacts. They have been preserved because they were um, idealized at the time or, or valued at the time. They've been taken out of context. Is the fact that they're out of context uh, damning enough that it wasn't worth preserving them in the first place? Or, I mean, what's the balance here? We're learning, but, you know. I guess I would, I would answer that question. So uh, my mom asks, um, what's the value of, <laughs> hey, I'm just being real. Um, uh, what's the value of preservation? Um, and like, does the fact that like, so we've decontextualized these objects, we move them to a place where they're being preserved and saved and they're, they're not deteriorating as they would had we left them on the ground or something. And I guess I would um, respond to that question with a question which is what, are, what is preservation? So um, I brought back the slide of the Frank Kirche. Is preservation reconstructing the church or is preservation leaving the ruins? Um, I think you could argue it either way. Um, and uh, there's a lot of debates over this in art. For instance, um, should we restore old paintings that have gotten dirty or should we leave them? I think like the Mona Lisa is like a famous example of that. I think like a bunch of Italians are chomping at the bit to like clean the painting and the French are like, no. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think um, there's, it's, it seems easy to say like, oh, preservation is like always the right thing to do. But it's not always clear what that means. Um, and it also is not always clear what the consequences of that are. Sort of um, thinking about this example of the church, reconstructing the church has these political risks um, uh, and these cultural risks. Um, so, and they, right, and in either case, if you leave the painting dirty or if you clean it, you're, you are either, either one is an argument for the past. Um, neither of which I think can we say is like the right one, at least not uh, self-evidently. Yeah. I do think that we're sort of like talking a lot about particularly like narrative, like anytime something gets involved, that story that becomes canon. So as we're talking about like making memorial or history or academia or artistry, can we talk a little about safeguards or how to prevent ourselves from doing what Shaden did? <laughs> or <laughs> like, <laughs> like um, or is there any, or is it just like hindsight? And like, once it's in the past, that narrative has yeah. been time and that there is no safeguard. So uh, basically, uh, Doug is like, um, when after I said, uh, objectivity is nonsense, throw that out. Uh, Doug was like, uh, so should we just make stuff up then? Um, uh, <laughs> um, As an institution that, you know, objectifies objects. <laughs> um, uh, and um, to that, I guess, um, I don't know about, safeguards like I don't know that there's um I think this is where there's okay I guess one way that I would answer that question is that there are safeguards insofar as like academic institutions especially are very concerned with like the fact that historians should have evidence for what they're saying is their narrative, right? Like an archeologist can't just like roll up and blow stuff up anymore. They have to um, like be able to, in order to get that paper published, they have to get other archeologists to look at it sort of through this process of peer review to say like, okay, this is what I say it is. And here's how I know it is what I say it is. And um, all of this stuff and historians have to do the same thing, especially through like archival research, right? They have to say like, these are the documents I looked at and this is what they prove. Um, uh, which I know this sort of contradicts that earlier thing I said about ob objectivity. Um, but to that, I would say, I think the tension in there is that like, you're always making an argument. Like it's, it's never self-evident what the documents are saying. It's never self-evident what the artifacts have to say. And certainly I think like Schliemann sort of went 
on a, his own sort of wild um, story making. But I think, um, you know, like that sort of thing would not <laughs> pass muster in sort of serious circles. And a lot of those um, sites are protected in ways that they weren't before. Um, so I guess those are the kinds of safeguards that I would think about is that we we do have like institutions and groups of people that are concerned with making sure that the knowledge that we're producing with the, that the paths that we're making um, are uh, grounded in, in some kind of evidence, even if objective truth is kind of this hazy, um, perpetually receding horizon. I'll have to take note yeah. and follow up and say, What about the removing of all the statues in the south oh. of Grant? And I mean, we're kind of living in that history right yeah. now, right? No, and that's kind of interesting to see the eagles coming down yeah. when they decide to do it and the guilt that they had and the guilt we don't have until. 200? <laughs> yeah, so I will say like that, that sort of like German guilt is that um, I would, my, I actually don't know the specific history of how those eagles were taken down. Um, and uh, There's a German historian out there who uh, would be able to tell you that. But I, um, my, my guess is that like, it was mostly like the allied powers that did a lot of that. Um, uh, trials. I mean, they actually right. did something after that. Right. And right? Like, right, which is which is not to say that like there wasn't guilt, because of course there was. Um, but I think uh, that like sort of among Germans was a very fraught thing, especially with like the generation of people that like, lived during the war and committed a lot of those atrocities. Um, so I think, uh, which is to say, I think the like the Confederate memorials is a really good parallel to that. Um, a lot of those were constructed in like the early 20th century as like a justification for Jim Crow. Um, uh, yeah. In the context of, for those Confederate memorials, in the context of the annex, you know, could put them all in a warehouse and people could still right. see Right, or do we put them in place? place? Put up to incendiary. Yeah, no, oh yeah, sorry. We can also argue that like it was never a preservation in the first place. I'm half actively meant before anybody comes to the land land of the earth. Serving this area. I suppose it could be preserved in areas from some point. Yeah. Uh, you know, something that was built during a rain and something that was built long after. Yeah, and I, so um, the discussion here was kind of that um, there's, it's not always self evident what is being preserved when um, folks are calling for preservation of something like, uh, for instance, like a Confederate monument. Um, and again, I would sort of say, I think the, um, this reconstructed church is another way of thinking about that, right? Like this is sort of the, um, oh, what's the uh, ship of Theseus, right? Um, the, the ship that was like, where sort of bricks were, or bricks, <laughs> not an effective shipbuilding material. Um, the uh, pieces of wood were replaced as they were rotted until none of the, um, none of the wood in the ship of Theseus was the original ship of Theseus, which isn't like totally true of this church. So there's like a, you can kind of see on the left, like one of those turrets is, is part of the original structure, and, um, which is sort of like the way that historians say like, see, we have preserved like the, um, uh, uh, but what's gonna happen is this limestone of the new church is going to turn black, just like the old stuff. And over, uh, it's actually sandstone, sorry. I think, or is it limestone? I think it's limestone. Um, and as it darkens, it will no longer be distinguishable which parts of the structure are original and which parts are the reconstruction. Um, and so again, like what is being preserved here, I think is not a clear question or there isn't a clear answer to that question. What David is doing is the whole thing I said Over it, like, very sort of 
spirit thing. And you know, I know we're going to this specific year or whatever, but that just needs to be color. And there's usually some business people in town, even though it's accurate. Right. 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 I mean, I think, you know, I think there's an argument for um, uh, leaving, and where did they go? Um, for leaving the statues white. Uh, just, you know, aesthetically, I sort of find the painted one a little garish. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but also, um, you know, again, it's this, this idea of the palimpsest, right? Like if you've if you scraped and, and rewritten the text so many times, like what does it mean to restore the piece of paper to its original form? Um, you know, like the the white statue is, and in fact, so the artist who created the render the who created the painted one um, said is against the idea that like the actual original statue should be repainted. Um, so he made this, I forget his name, but he, he created like a replica of, I think he was an archeologist maybe. He created a replica of the statue anyway and repainted it according to um, the forensic information he had of what it likely, how it was likely painted. And, um, and I think uh, it's, you know, I think a lot of that history of the, um, of classical nostalgia is an important one, right? Like we need to remember that that nostalgia for this vision of the classics that never existed became the justification for something truly horrifying. Um, and so if we repaint all the statues, then are we then also erasing the memory of that ideology? <laughs> Um, I just want to say again a huge thank you to Scott. Um, let you guys know the exhibition is still up until the 22nd. Malaika will be giving a talk on May 21st talking about the history of ceramics. So we can, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of the Bronze Age to today um, and how that will work. And um, thank you so much. Yeah. It's nice to have you. Um, thank you guys so much.